You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. I was having a conversation with a buddy of mine in a bar a couple days ago. And, and he was just lamenting the White Sox offseason. And he was like, I don't know what they're doing. And I, I don't know what this season's going to look like. And if, if they don't get off to a hot start, like right away, it's going to be miserable. And just like, just the doom and the gloom and the cloud over his head. And I get it because I know we've all gone through this at some point over the last couple of months when it comes to, to realizing that the budget isn't increasing when it should uh, when you see these teams making these monster deals, and we're going to talk about that on the show today, there's a great article that came out on Fangraphs that explains the fiscal responsibility of actually signing some of these monster long-term deals. Like, they actually broke down why it would be a good business decision to do it, which I, th- I don't think anybody has even taken that angle on it, so I want to dive into it today. But, but he's sitting there, and he's telling me all this doom and gloom, and he's worried, and, and, he, and he doesn't know how to, how to think of the team, and... And I said, you know, this is the biggest problem the White Sox have right now, Ed, is that they have a massive perception problem. Like, sure, they could wait and make moves in January and February, but from a business standpoint, how can you be making season ticket sales and getting renewals and generating interest during the holiday season when people are trying to figure out what they're going to spend their money on and put underneath the tree? Like, this is the first time in several years I haven't listed like eight White Sox things that I want. Like, I was like, give me some Illini stuff. They had a good football season. I, I, need, a, I need a refresh on that one, you know? I, 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 maybe I'll get some Bears stuff. Some of my Bears stuff is getting a little old, and, you know, they got some promise. It's just a weird thing because waiting to do anything that would spark any positivity has got to be costing you money in the long run because the fan base is so upset. You're right. I mean, how, how, do, you, how do you allocate your dollars as a fan if you're sitting watching a team that felt like it was stuck in the mud and stuck in neutral for the entirety of the 2022 season, getting into this off season, watching them kind of sit and not really do much. I mean, the Mike Clevenger signing is, is it really. And, and you're not seeing the trade market heat up in general. You're not seeing the trade market heat up. You're not seeing them make smaller moves. They're just sitting there. And how are you supposed to feel about that? I, I don't know. This episode of Socks in the Basement and every episode of Socks in the Basement brought to you by Family Waterproofing Solutions for bowing walls, window wells, foundation crack repairs, some pumps, gutter cleaning. You know, my backyard looks like a little bit of a swamp after the uh, precipitation over the last couple of days, but I'm not nervous at all because Family Waterproofing Solutions looks out for me. If you have a problem right now or something that you're trying to prevent, give them a call 24-7. 708-330-4466. Mention Socks in the Basement. Get additional money off. Your basement's best defense is at FamilyDry.com. Let's talk about the rumor that kind of got circulated. I want to say Dave Kaplan said something about how he had heard the White Sox were close to getting a left fielder. I always find this stuff interesting because, you know, there could be smoke and it could be a real rumor, but the deal could fall apart and they could not go out and get a left fielder for months. So you don't know if it's imminent or not. But let's just say that they are closing in, and based upon the wording that Cap said, the the way I've heard it, and Cap's been a guest on this show several times before, uh, based upon the way that he kind of put that out there, I'm assuming a signing, which would make sense. I know that they're right at the limit of what Rick Hahn said they would be at for payroll, and that's why we're looking at trades, but... Everybody in Major League Baseball made about $30 million extra dollars with the sale of that streaming service to Disney. And that came after Hans' comments. So maybe there's a little wiggle room when it comes to the money and they're actually looking at someone. I took a look at the leftover you know, outfielders, specifically guys that you, you would think of as traditional left fielders. And I got one name that if they went out and signed right now, that I would feel more positive. Right. I mean, I got a lot of names that if they went out and signed, I go, oh, that's underwhelming or, oh, I don't like that. Or that's that's not as good as even A.J. Pollock standing out there. You're you've downgraded. You know, I mean, I I, I don't want to watch Joey Gallo go out and hit one ninety nine and have all the sabermetricians tell me how valuable he is. That's just going to frustrate me all year long. The 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 old uh, 
But if you look at his underlying statistics, he should be better. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that's great. If you look at my underlying statistics, I should be sexier too. Yeah. I mean, like, here's the thing. He's like that player that for years, for years, and this is before he's even been mentioned in the same breath as the White Sox. He's the kind of baseball player that whenever I saw people talk about how great he was or talk about, you know, that he had all this talent, I would always sit there and say, what is with the hype with this guy? You know, like I would never, I, I never want a guy on my team that hits 200. I don't care if he hits 40 home runs a year. I saw Adam Dunn. He's been on this team before. This is another Adam Dunn. Like Joey Gallo has the potential to be Adam Dunn when he, if he came to this team. And I know I can't stomach that because I was against the Adam Dunn signing from the moment they announced it. I was like, oh, this is going to be a problem. Yeah, even though everybody said, oh, it doesn't matter if he hits low. Look at all those bombs he's going to hit. I remember he walked out there in the wintertime, Adam Dunn. What was that, like 11 that they signed him? And and and, yeah. and he goes out there and he looks at the, the giant billboards that are out behind the concourse. And he goes, has anybody ever hit that? Maybe I'll try to hit it. Well, you didn't, Adam. You never hit it. And even if you would have hit it, you would have hit it when you were hitting like, you know, 120. It was a disastrous signing. I look at Joey Gallo, I go, that's Adam Dunn. That's the baseball fan in me. I'm sure somebody can sit down and break down all the statistics and tell me I'm wrong. Joey Gallo's Adam Dunn in my mind. I don't want him. You know, Adam Duvall, David Peralta, uh, you know, they're, they're give and take about what you had with A.J. Pollock. It would be underwhelming to me. I think if you if you dip down even lower and got your Jerickson Profars or your Tommy Fams, I'd be like, well, that's terrible. Now, I mean, I guess it's a real outfielder, and we haven't had a lot of real outfielders in the outfield, but it'd be underwhelming. If Andrew Benatendi showed up, where he either has a high average and maybe doesn't slug as well, or when he hits 275, he hits a, he hits close to 20 bombs, and he's a left-handed hitter who's high contact and plays left field fairly well, I would probably say that's a positive. We may not have done anything during the winter meetings, but that's an upgrade. That's something I'd be excited about. Do you think I'm nuts? Am I, am I reaching for things here? No, not at all. Not at all. Because you're right. You look at what's out there. And Joey Gallo is known as a plus defender who had a bad defensive season. Joey Gallo is known as a plus power hitter who is low contact, so he's a three true outcomes guy. And no, the Sox don't need that. They don't need Adam Dunn 2.0, who just happens to be better in right field. Really, if you believe in Luis Robert, you believe in Aloy Jimenez, okay, and you believe in Andrew Vaughn as hitters, even if you still believe in Yohan Moncada, which it's getting harder to believe, uh, and definitely, you know, with what they have in Tim Anderson, what they really need is they need complementary baseball. So a guy like Ben Intendi, he can be a high contact guy if they need on base percentage, or he can be a power hitter if they need somebody to go for slugging from that side. And maybe it's just which way the wind is blowing as far as literally the day of the game or, you know, how the ball is playing, how the pitchers are playing this year. You got a guy like that who's also 28 years old who's probably going to be a little bit of a longer-term investment, but that's okay. That's that's not a bad thing, and we'll get into why. But somebody like that makes a lot of sense. Somebody like that is somebody that, as a Sox fan, I can get excited about. And I can sit there and say, okay, you signed Mike Clevenger and Andrew Benintendi. That's not a bad offseason in general, okay? Because you've filled a couple of holes. You've got a starting pitcher that is on a revenge tour and is is trying to prove it, and that's not a bad thing to have. You've got a legitimate outfielder to go out there and play left field and you're not trying to run Andrew Vaughn or Gavin Sheets out there and you're not necessarily relying on Oscar Colas to come up and be something now if he does and he takes right field over that's gravy it's not needed as we're sitting here right now the problem with the White Sox is it's needed for somebody like Oscar Colas to step up and fill in right we have one Outfielder, that's that's insane. Maybe that's why everybody's got doom and gloom. The wood from this tree melts the ball Deep to right field into the bleachers. Morningwoodbats.com is the custom wooden baseball bat company that'll help you smoke them over the fence. Wow! Check out our custom bat builder that allows you to pick the wood species, model, and color and get custom personalized engraving that'll be drop shipped right to you. Put some life in your lumber with Morningwood. Morningwoodbats.com. 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 Do it today. Remember to use the code SOX22 to get 10% off on your order at MorningwoodBats.com. And Ed, uh, if you have not bought me a gift yet, 
I mean, that's where you can go. I, I, I would prefer to have just a new piece of memorabilia up here. It doesn't even need to be a White Sox hitter, although the Frank Thomas bat is kind of cool. The replica bats, I think, are my favorite thing. I, they have a lot more on that website, but the replica bats, I mean, for collectors, uh, that, that's... I, this is the this is the season when I'm trying to figure out like what I want, and I'm the worst when it comes to Christmas shopping. I don't I don't know if if you're easier on your family. People beg me for what I want for Christmas, and I constantly just say like I just want like the world to be easier. Like I is there any way that you could kind of fix some of my real life problems because I don't need any more stuff. Like I'm terrible at giving people ideas, but MorningwoodBats.com would be a good one. Hey, look, you know what? If you get the right bat, it might help you solve some of those real life problems. Just saying. Yeah. Well. That that's true. That's true for the White Sox as well. There's a there's a bunch of free agents that are still out there. And I know we keep focusing on the idea that the White Sox will only make moves with trades. But I still think there's got to be a little wiggle room in that in that salary cap after they got the extra money. I mean, look, Major League Baseball Players Association has come out and said, Ed, that teams should be spending the money they picked up in that deal when Major League Baseball finished selling the rest of their streaming service. To Disney, Sox should really have 20 to 30 million extra dollars because of that deal for this year's budget. So it, it isn't inconceivable. I don't know if it's going to happen, but it, are there guys right now that are floating out there? Like, let's say you were in a, you're Rick Hahn and you accidentally just like fast forwarded like a month and a half, two months in the offseason. All of a sudden you woke up and you're like, I didn't do anything at the winter meetings. You know, like remember that Adam Sandler movie? It was terrible. It was called Click. Yeah, I remember where, that. Like yeah. he would just hit the little button and he would sleepwalk through life until he got to the important parts. Like what if Rick Hahn has one of those devices and literally sleepwalk to this point in, in, in the offseason? And now all of a sudden he's back to regular speed and he goes, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I didn't do anything. At the, what is there out there? Are there guys out there right now that you think, let's say we give them 10 million extra in wiggle room or 15 million extra in wiggle room for this year? OK, which is far less than what you would think they would have after that deal. Are there guys out there right now that you think bring them in? You can fix this offseason still. Oh, 100 percent. I, I mean, first of all, with the trade thing, there's no saying that the trades wouldn't necessarily add to the payroll, because if you're going to trade guys that are prospects for established veterans, you're always going to be adding payroll. We've always just assumed that they're going to try and match payroll for payroll trade Lucas Giolito's 10 million for 10 million worth of something else right right trade Liam Hendricks is 15 million a year for the next two years on average uh and, you know and only add 15 million back more I get what you're saying yeah so are there guys that are out there yeah so we still need a second baseman right and there are there are names that are again not stars and, and not guys that you're going to sit there and necessarily buy their jersey but guys that would potentially be helpful to the team, right? I take Segura. He played on my fantasy baseball team for several years. I know that he produces. He's consistent and he produces. He was everybody's prom date last year because they were going to trade Craig Kimbrell to the Phillies for Gene Segura. That was like, that was the dunzo deal of the of the of the offseason where this is what was going to happen. And we were penciling Segura in at second base. Right. Like if you wanted him so badly, go get him right now. That's the thing that th that's the mind boggling. Especially one year deal. If you're if you're going all in before you start losing guys like like we talked about, if you're going all in this year, then a guy like Segura makes sense. Spend the money for this year. Uh, see what happens. If he's great. Fantastic. If he falls on his face and the team doesn't do so well. Eh. It may fit. I, I think the way the market is right now, though, that that you might have players that believe they're going to get longer deals because some of these giant deals that were signed, you know, I mean, what the heck? Trey Turner got 11 years. Correa got 13 and Bogert's got 11. I mean, Dansby Swanson's looking for probably 40 years. <laughs> well, yeah. At this point, Swanson's sitting there going, I got to do better than all of them. I got to I got to get at least 15. It might just be skewed what players think they're going to get because of what the big boys got on the top. But if, it, if if there's some reason that gets into the conversation, maybe a Segura still is something that would be possible for the White Sox. I, I want to talk real quick about the, uh, and I want to dive into this. Maybe we can get back into some of these other free agents that are out there. But there was an interesting article by Fangraphs, and I was going to try to get the author on. It just didn't work out for this show. So uh, because we don't have the guest, I'll bring the segment to you from the village of Lamont. They normally do all the guests, but they'll just bring this, this interesting segment we're going to talk about. Uh, the fiscal responsibility of these long-term deals that we're seeing. Want to experience a downtown with real history, great eats and drinks, and green spaces filled with adventure? Visit the Village of Lamont, shop, dine, drink, and explore, and see all they have to offer. They have a brand new 
location there by Pollyanna Brewing now. They have the Pollyanna Social. Really? Yeah, they're distillers now. So Pollyanna is now distilling liquors and, uh, you know, and spirits. And then they're they're making like, you know, fancy drinks. So it's something to check out with all the lights in Lamont. See more at LamontDowntown.com. All right. So uh, this article in Fangraphs that may have flown under the radar. I didn't see a lot of people react to it. And probably because as you start to read it, you start to get a headache unless you're somebody that really gets numbers and finance. And I'm not that kind of person. Um, but the the article is why are teams issuing extremely long contracts by Ben Clemens on fan graphs? And to surmise what he is saying in the article and search it down if you want to read the whole thing, and get all the details, is that because of inflation and then also looking at interest rates, and looking at where we were at a couple years ago, it made more sense for teams to sign these short-term deals, which they were doing. And now, because of the interest rates and because of the rate of inflation and this weird time that we're at in our economy, he makes a case that it would be fiscally responsible to sign long-term deals for these big superstars. Because if you just simply took money that would be owed to that player down the line, and instead of keeping it in the bank, bought a bond, like buy $35 million in bonds and use the current rate, the current interest rate, you would be able to pay years down the line far less for the contract. So I'm going to I'm going to read one paragraph here that has to do with the Carlos Correa deal, which was a, a, a big deal. What did, what did he get? He got 13 years with San Francisco. 13 years. That's a lot of years. That's a that's well past when he's going to actually be playing. What he goes through is that with a current interest rate of 3.61%, the Giants have to put away $285.4 million today to secure Correa's payments for the next 13 years. And by the time they're paying for the last year of the deal, they only really need to invest $17.59 million today. In fact, they'd be paying less if you just invested in bonds let the interest rate grow, and then paid him with the dividends and the money that you made off of the bonds. So essentially, if that were the strategy employed by the Giants, his contract is actually $50 million cheaper because of the way that it's spread out, looking at current interest rates and looking at uh, inflation. It's basically saying that if you're looking at the way the market is going, if you're willing to do these long-term deals... And you, you've planned this out properly and you do your investing properly and you're a smart business person. You're not actually paying what it looks like on paper because you're going to earn some of that with your investments over the next 13 years while you're getting ready to pay all of Correa's contract off on the back end. Plus, that big money 10 years from now on these long term deals isn't really worth as much because the dollar is going to be worth less. It, it's, it's a crazy thing fiscal thing to wrap your head around, Ed. But what it's basically saying is that it's almost fiscally responsible and business sound to sign the long-term deals, which kind of flies in the face of Jerry Reinsdorf doesn't spend money because he's being fiscally responsible. It more suggests to me that the White Sox yet again are behind the curve where other teams have found, you know, something in the market that, that not everybody else has figured out yet. And once again, you're behind the curve. It's like, it's like shades of when you read the Moneyball book 20 years ago and it made fun of Kenny Williams because he didn't get it yet, right? Like other teams had figured it out like the A's, but Kenny hadn't yet. And they kind of rip him in the book. Once again, it feels like the Sox are behind because they haven't figured this out in the marketplace yet. Well, and and it's it, what the article is really saying too is that it, it is a different story last year when interest rates were historically low versus where they are now that it, it makes a huge difference in terms of what investments are going to yield back. And if we assume that inflation is going to continue to be something of an issue over the course of an 11-year contract, yeah, in 11 years, that money, that that a average annual value that we're seeing, this these high numbers, isn't going to be as bad as it was today, you know, in terms of taking up a fair chunk of your, your payroll. Also, you have to factor in that under the CBA, the luxury threshold is going to go up, right? It, it rises. There's no salary cap in baseball, but that's kind of the thing that everybody looks at. So really what they're saying is it makes sense. Lock these guys down for the long term because on the back end of the contract, basically the money is cheaper money. It, it, it's today's dollars, but it's cheaper money then. Now, these guys are also going to be in their late 30s. They're going to be pushing 40, some of them into their 40s. 
with these big dollar contracts. But the other thing, too, that I, I think is a factor, it's not listed in the article, but really, if you think about it, players are still lasting longer. I mean, I know there was the extreme of the, the PED era where guys were, you know, outperforming their 20s in their late 30s. That's not what we're talking about. But it's not a stretch to sit there and say that Carlos Correa is still playing at a decently high level where the dollar amount you're paying him is at or below market level for what he's producing. And so where the White Sox fall apart, I think, on this is, is one of two things. One, it's the presumption that a player is going to fall off so hard in their mid to late 30s that you don't want to lock anybody down for that long. It's something that I think is a little short-sighted in terms of how they view the game today versus maybe what it was in the 1980s when Jerry took over. The other thing is the idea that you're only going to spend for a few years on a guy, it's about this return on investment and what I think the Sox have always missed about that is the idea that if I lock up a guy long term and he's happy with the deal. Now, these guys are all signing these deals. They're all happy with these deals. OK, but imagine as a White Sox fan, if you never saw Frank Thomas as an Oakland A or a, or a Toronto Blue Jay, you never saw the Miami Marlins version of Mark Burley. Yes, they're not what they once were on the back end of the contract, but they still are what you know, they're still your favorite player. Socks in the Basement listeners do the hard work. And if you're a hardworking man or woman on the South Side, you need to be outfitted properly. And that's why you should visit Red Wing Shoes in Evergreen Park, New Lenox, and Geneva. A work boot specialty store that carries sizes from 6 to 16 and feet as wide as 4E. A 115-year-old company that came out of Red Wing, Minnesota. And one of its largest stores in the entire Midwest is in Evergreen Park, Illinois, ever since 1976. When you're on your feet, the footwear is everything. So why not get an expert fitting? They warranty, repair, and offer free conditioning with laces. And they also carry Carhartt work clothing as well. Located at 3347 West 95th Street in Evergreen Park, Illinois, at 208 East Maple Street on Route 30 in New Lenox, or at 1749 South Randall Road in Geneva. Visit them today. You work hard. You've earned it. Red Wing Shoes. Letting go of Frank was a mistake because he still performed afterwards. Right. His ankle healed and then he was he was still able to play. Right. And picking picking Danks over Burley, because that's what they were doing, they were deciding to give the money and investment into John Danks instead of believing in the guy that had been their best pitcher over a decade. Right? I mean, like, Mark Burley is probably the only legitimate Hall of Famer that is going to come out of that era besides Frank Thomas. I mean, and Frank was at the, he's at the back end of Frank's era, right? Because he, right. he really kind of gets going in the two thousands where, where Frank was in the nineties and kind of finishing up in the two thousands. But like, you know, Mark Burley is a far greater chance of making the, you know, the, the hall of fame than any of these other guys that he, that were his contemporaries on the White Sox. And you made the decision to go with Danks instead of Burley and Burley performed better in the following years after that. Then what Danks did, in fact, in the end, you ate Danks' money to just get him off the team. And 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 because Danks fell apart. White Sox have always been concerned about the back end of these contracts, but the really good players have proven time and time again when the White Sox thought they were washed up, they still were good. They may not have been in their prime, but they were still better than what the White Sox went out and got to replace them. And and so it really does show not only a short-sightedness, it almost shows like this belief that the billionaire owner thinks that, well, these guys are just, once they get their money, they won't try anymore, right? Like, doesn't it kind of smack of that? Like, a, a low opinion bit. of the player? It smacks of a low opinion of the player to never want to invest. But it, you, the, Burley and, and, and Thomas are perfect examples because here are two guys that are really good players that the owner and the team would never consider these kinds of long-term deals for and let go of when they still had stuff left in the tank and still performed at a high level. You're right, if the Sox would invest into the best players. I'm not saying the crappy players deserve long-term deals, but your high-end guys. Rick, put the checkbook away. Larry does not need more years is what we're saying. Right, exactly. Like, what's more fiscally irresponsible? Three years and $16.5 million to Larry Garcia because he happened to get a hold of a home run in game three. But he had shown that he was never going to be anything other than a replacement-level player, and he was on the decline. What's more fiscally irresponsible? The deal for him 
that you gave him money or whether or not you would tack on, uh, you know, one more year into Manny Machado's deal when you were trying to secure him and use that money in a different way. To me, it's mind boggling how the team thinks. It's very short sighted when they're trying to figure out what they'll invest in because they'll sign all these piddly little deals you know, where they can get out of them after a couple years because they don't have any confidence in the player, but they never push their chips in on a guy that's a proven superstar. Carlos Correa's comments in the offseason and even during the season last year when he was asked about his approach at the plate and talking about his expected batting average and his weighted runs created and the, and, and the understanding of how you could be valuable even when you're slumping by just trying to get on base and his hitting philosophy, those comments alone made him worth that money because that's the kind of guy that you can sit there and say, realistically, I don't think there's a drop off. I think this guy understands value and understands how to hit and wants to be a star and wants to be in the hall of fame one day. Right. And wants to show everybody that whatever happened in in Houston didn't mean anything because he could be a star anywhere. He has the motivation. You should be able to look at his numbers, look at his personality and understand he's worth that kind of investment. And those kind of players, when they come along, the Sox never believe in them as much as other smart organizations believe in those types of players. And that's why we're always just a seat at the table, but we never actually get anything. Yeah, and getting back to Burley, Burley gets a contract earlier where when it comes up to that time to renew John Danks and figure out if you want to keep him around or you can afford to, if Burley's average annual value, because he signed a longer-term deal with more guaranteed money, at potentially a lower value because of how much earlier the contract was signed. Maybe, just maybe, it's not a stretch to sit there and say, we can afford both of these guys because we can configure Danks' contract around the last couple of years of Burley, and we've got these guys together for a little bit longer. Talk about guys to believe in. When did Mark Burley ever let you down on the mound? When did he never answer the bell? When did he not show up? When was he hurt? Right. And you do that, and you look at that, and you go, it's infuriating to sit there and say, we don't give pitchers more than a couple of years because they might break down. Well, when a guy's got a track record, maybe sometimes you reward the track record. And when a guy like Carlos Correa comes around, who he's a leader in the clubhouse, is incredibly smart about how he approaches the game, is incredibly knowledgeable, is is a guy that can rise above the stink of what happened in Houston, like you said. Yeah, that guy's worth a lot of money. And if you had gone out and signed him, if the White Sox had gone out and offered him that contract... And then sat there and said, hey, we got to unload some salary. Guess what they would have been able to do? Still move some salary if they needed to to accommodate that, but you'd have a superstar shortstop for the next 11 years. And on the back end of that deal, maybe he's not what he was in 2023, but he might still be really, really good. Right. And let's go back to the let's go back to the Frank Thomas thing real quick, just to kind of illustrate this. We'll use a White Sox player of your. okay? and you talk about these long term deals. Let's say you come along and Frank Thomas, when he's in his year uh, 29, 30, or 31 year, I mean, pick any one of them. He's he's third in the MVP voting and he's an all-star at 29. Because the the three big shortstops are Trey Turner's 29, Carlos Correa's 28, Xander Bogarts is 30. Those are the top three shortstops that have Okay, so yeah, let's take take Frank Thomas at the age of 29, hitting 347 with a 1067 OPS, an OPS plus of 181 that year. All-star and in the MVP vote. He should have won it in 1997. Should have won right. the MVP Absolutely. in that year. Okay, that was a joke. That's that's one that was stolen from him, okay, in the steroid era. That's the one I think that pisses him off the most. Okay, when you listen to him talk, like he knows he should have been the MVP. You, you have him out in free agency now, and he's entering his year 30 season. So he'd be right about where we're seeing all these long-term deals. If you signed Frank Thomas to a 10-year deal, you would have gotten value all the way through the thing. Here's a, here's a proven guy who was who was an all star that you could tell by that point was a professional hitter that was and and, and he, look at the years after he leaves the White Sox in his year thirty eight year for Oakland he hits two seventy with a nine twenty six OPS and thirty nine home runs right I mean imagine if you would have locked him in back in nineteen ninety seven on a ten year deal and, and the value of the dollar all those years later he you would have been getting him at a steal and he would have finished his career in a White Sox uniform. You look at his age 39 year when he's playing for Toronto. Sure, he starts to dip off a little bit, but he's still hitting 277 with an 857 OPS. He's still he's still a 125 OPS plus, so he's well over the average. So he's giving you a positive, and he hits 26 home runs when he's 39 years old. I mean, his his final year is the only thing you could take umbrage with when he becomes human, and he's league average looking at his OPS in his final year when he's 40 years old. 
He would have been a perfect investment. That's what you're paying for with the long-term deals. You're not giving it to middling players, okay? Carlos Correa is of the level. Some of these guys that are being signed are of the level. I don't know if Xander Bogarts is, but some of these guys are being signed are at the level where that's a good investment if you really believe in the player. It's something the White Sox miss the boat on every time. And, it, and, and, you, and right now we've taken two White Sox players of war and we pointed out why it would have made sense to have them in longer term deals. It would have been more fiscally responsible for the team and you would have gotten good production out of them. It, it, the short-sighted thinking is probably the biggest Achilles heel of this team. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always on SocksInTheBasement.com.